Thanks very much, James. It's great to be here. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, so first of all, I think I should just start by saying, has anyone ever heard of either Pastafarianism or the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster? <laughs> great, so actually quite a lot of you have. Um, fantastic. Um, where have you come across it? Just let's take a quick sort of survey. Yeah. Um, I have over 3,000 posts on the forum. <laughs> Amazing. I haven't been on it for several years now, but I've stopped you short of becoming a prophet. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah? I first came across it referred to in, in Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, any other? And I, I've heard of it or seen it on US military dog pants. Right, yeah. As a recognised religion. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Now that's that's an interesting point actually, because what I'm here to talk about today is is Pastafarianism a religion? Or is it a parody of a religion? What is the difference between a religion and a parody of a religion? Because the whole point of Pastafarianism, I think, as it has sort of developed since its origin in about two thousand and five, is its cha its challenge to the question of where do you draw the line between a belief that is worth recognizing and privileging in law and a belief that is not. Does it have to have, do you have to sort of, are there some beliefs that are supernatural beliefs which are entitled to a special status? Um, are all beliefs equally silly? That's what some pastafarians seem to suggest. So these are the questions that um, I'll be looking at today. Um, so first of all, where did it come from? So it was started by Bobby Henderson, a physics graduate, through a letter, um, I think it's actually 2005, but different sources say different things, to the Kansas um, State Board of Education. Um, because the, the Board of Education in Kansas had decided they were going to teach intelligent design um, on a level with evolution as equal theories. Um, and Bobby was completely outraged by this. He said, no way should intelligent design, which you know, um, it imagines that, that God created the world and there is good evidence to suggest this, um, is, is, a, is a theory of equal weight to evolutionary theory. So I think right from the beginning, it's, it's quite important that Pastafarianism, flying spaghetti monsterism, started off as a challenge to religion from the perspective of science. And I think it's actually come on quite a long way from that. It's developed in all sorts of interesting directions. Um, what Bobby didn't realise he was doing was, was starting a meme. This is the early days of the internet and, and real connections between people across the world. Um, and it was, he just hit it at the right moment because mid-2000s is also when we had the God Delusion, I think just a year or two later, and we had um, Christopher Hitchens, we had all of the sort of the new atheist movement. A few years later, um, about 2008, 2009, we had Humanists UK, um, doing their atheist bus campaign, which was wildly successful. In the 2011 census, some people put Jediism as their religion just for the sake of parody. And there have been other um, parody religions, such as the Temple of Satan, and there, there are many others. They all have slightly different angles. Um, but so, yeah, Bobby Henderson's idea was um, I believe that the whole universe was created by a flying spaghetti monster. Um, there are the overwhelming scientific evidence pointing towards evolutionary processes as nothing but a coincidence. So he was clearly mocking the idea that um, intelligent design says, well, you know, all this evidence about dinosaurs is nothing but a coincidence. Now, bear in mind, of course, that the, this sort of intelligent design argument and the idea that the universe was created by God in seven days, safe to say that is a belief which is not held by, by, by any means by, by all Christians. Obviously, it's held by some, especially in America in certain evangelical churches. So I think Bobby's original flying spaghetti monster was specifically directed against that. But since then, pastafarianism has been directed against all sorts of different aspects of different religions in different ways. Um, so this is Bobby's just a little sketch to um, the benefit of the Kansas Board of Education. Him, trees, mountains, Richard. So there we go. That, that was how it started, just by this little sketch, you know, as it were on the back of it. Um, and this is a 2015 um, artist's impression of, of the creation of man by the flying spaghetti monster. Um, and one of the aspects in which um, um, flying spaghetti monsterism has become slightly um, 
has offended some people later on is because it is definitely quite crude, it's definitely quite funny, but in a slightly acerbic way, slightly, it's definitely not politically correct. Um, it's very much uh, with, with a certain idea of the human anatomy in mind, you might say. <laughs> Well, this is 2015, so this is only what eight years later, and it's already become it's, it's certainly not just attacking evangelical American Christianity, it's, it's criticizing Catholicism as well and all religion. Um, okay, so maybe less than a year after the original letter to the Kansas State Board of Education, we have the Gospel of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. So, this, you know, again, is very much its parody, it is laughing at religion, specifically, especially Christianity, but also other religions as well. Um, and we have pirates, and we'll come on to why, why do we have pirates, which is again, it's part of the completely random and deliberately unbelievable aspect of characteristic of the In the beginning was the word, and the word was R, something like that. Um, okay, and in the Gospel of the Flying Spaghetti Monster, which is written in quite a haphazard fashion, it's not exactly um, deathless prose, um, but nonetheless, it's quite, it's, it's again quite rough and ready, but. Um, quite crude humour a lot of the time, but also tries to make a point about religion. You know, the eight, I'd really rather you didn't, it's a parody of the Ten Commandments, apparently the pirate Mosey to whom they were communicated lost two of them at the end, which is why there are only eight. Um, and number six is, I'd really rather you didn't build multi-million dollar churches, temples, mosques, shrines to my newly goodness, when the money could be better spent doing other altruistic things. Um, so in other words, we see here, um, it is attacking religion in general is criticizing the whole world, um, religion as, as a business specifically. Okay, so um, already by 2007 we get the Council of Europe um, saying um, pastafarianism was spread to Europe by this point. Pastafarianism is a parody on religion, um, etc. In, in response to this teaching of intelligent, intelligent design and science courses. Full of irony, this pseudo-religion is setting a trend and the cult is spreading. So it's a pseudo-religion, as viewed by the Council of Europe. It's, it's a cult. It's a sort of strange, weird movement, but it's, it's started to really gather speed. Um, and it's spread around the world, too. These, these are some of the countries where have been, um, there are pastafarian um, groups, as far as I know. Um, from Trinidad and Tobago to New Zealand to Austria, um, all over the place, to Russia. Um, one Russian pastafarianism um, one Russian Asperian, um, Mikhail Ia Selevich, I think, um, was um, granted um, the right to be a Pastafarian in Russia, but then um, he was arrested um, on, on various political grounds, but he's recently been released and, and is now in Israel. So they're keeping going there as well. Um, so pirates, where do pirates come in? Well, this goes right back to Bobby Henderson's original letter um, to the Kansas State Board, um, because he said, well, look, um, in addition to believing that a flying spaghetti monster created the world, I also believe that global warming, etc., um, are a direct effect of the shrinking numbers of pirates since the 1800s. And he provided a lovely graph showing that you know, the shrinking numbers of pirates would increase with all these natural disasters. So it's all pseudoscience, in designed to mock the pseudoscience um, provided by um, intelligent design creationists in the US. Um, so again, it is science versus religion, but out of this science versus religion comes parody, and it comes pirates. And we have here um, Captain Tanya Watkins, um, the captain of the Australian Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster, who I interviewed a couple of years ago for National Secular Society. Um, and we have Bruder Spaghettus, um, of the German Pastor in England, and, and he is still very much in evidence. And in fact, um, he was featured on a documentary about Pastafarianism not that long ago. Um, he does dress in full pirate brigade yeah. on a regular basis, and he, he managed um, to, to get his application for a sign on the road accepted. Um, you know, again, this is, this is one instance, in fact, of, of how Pastafarians have started to sort of say, well, can we have the same privileges as religion? Because religious organisations can get a care advertisement of a mass or a church on a road sign, so why can't Pastafarians? And you see their own little logo, which is a bit like the ichthus of the Christians on their car, and then you have the Darwinian variant, and now there's the flying spaghetti monster variant. Um, so yeah, and he, um, in, in the film, I Pastafari, um, 
which was again made in um, 2019. It documents um, Brutus Bagetus and various other pastafarians in Europe. Um, and when we see Brutus Bagetus um, actually conduct a sort of a noodle mass, if you like, um, very seriously. So again, the question is, they take themselves seriously, but what are they taking seriously? What do they want people to get out of it? Because people like going, but they, they have a sense of community. So what's going on? This, this little joke of Bobby Henderson's just designed to be you know, sarcastic and to mock um, the, you know, Kansas um, religious um, people has just ballooned into this huge movement spread by the internet. <coughs> um, and, and it's really appealed. There's something about this humor that's really appealed to people. So then we start to have, um, in Europe and elsewhere around the world, challenges on the basis of pastafarianism to religious privilege. And for me, this is where it gets really interesting, because what pastafarians start to say is, look, if religious people can have the right to have the privilege to do X, Y, and Z and be treated differently in law compared with non-religious people, why shouldn't we? Because we're a religion too. And how are you going to prove we're not a religion? So this is again a question of you know, what is a religion and what isn't a religion. Um, why should established religions be treated differently from pastafarians? Okay, so this is just to remind you, I'm sure most people here will come across this, the European Convention on Human Rights, Article 9, um, safeguards the freedom of thought, conscience, and religion. Um, this right includes, um, importantly, freedom to change your religion or belief. Um, and also the right to manifest your religion of belief. And, and this has been the basis of the, the pastafarian cases in Europe. So first of all, um, in the Netherlands, and, and some of these cases were discussed in I Pastafari. So um, this man is um, Mathe Colin, I think his name is. And um, he decided that he really wanted to wear a colander um, on his head, for his driving license voting. Um, I should say that before colanders, pastafarians wore a full pirate regalia, but then it was um, Wiegham, the Austrian pastafarian, who introduced the idea of the colander as a sort of logical you know, development, because if, if it's about pasta, obviously you need colanders. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Matthew was developed by, um, eventually by Dirk Heinemann, who is not a pastafarian, he's just a general free thinker, I believe, but um, he's a legal scholar, and he decided that this would be a really interesting case um, to challenge this idea of what is a religion for the purpose of human, human rights law. Um, <coughs> unfortunately, um, they, they all lost their cases in the end, um, but it was it was an interesting challenge, I think. Um, so, Dirk Benham's perspective um, is, we say, as long as there are special rights for believers, they should apply to all religions. So, Pastafarians are saying, we believe, we believe in Pastafarianism. We can't say we don't. It may be that our religion is crazy. It may be that believing that a blind spaghetti monster Crazy the world is crazy, but you know, why is that crazier than any other religion? So why are you going to not allow us the privileges you give to other religions? So in another, in other words, you might say, well, actually, what this is really challenging is why should people get privileges in the state just because they're religious? When people who aren't religious don't get these privileges. What is it that's special about religions? If you like, it's, it's a sort of opposite way of thinking from the way historically people have thought. Because historically, I mean, if you look at European culture, which is Christian, or you know, similar cultures which have different religions, the, the status quo is religion should have privilege. But they're starting from the opposite perspective. They're starting from an atheist perspective, which is religion shouldn't have privilege. Um, that there needs to be a special justification, justification for it. Okay, so um, here, is, here are some pastafarians, or possible pastafarians outside the Dutch courts, courts in one of their cases. Um, they're wearing their colanders. Of course, you know, anyone can be a pastafarian. If I stuck a colander on my head now, I would say I'm a pastafarian. That, because the point is there's no difference between being one and not being one. You don't have to have a special point of And that is their whole point. They say they're a much nicer religion than most religions. <laughs> so, now, now we move to Austria. And Nico Alm, um, who is um, a former MP, in the um, Austrian Parliament. Um, he's a journalist and he really he's very political. Um, and he decided he wanted to have a colander on his head for his driving license photo. And I think what's interesting about these different cases is what they show about the way that we're different countries, different legal systems, and different sort of 
public authorities, state authorities have reacted to this idea of pastafarianism. Can they cope with pastafarianism? Can, can they tolerate it or not? And what is interesting it's often, is that it's often the most secular countries that are most hostile to pastafarianism, whereas the religious ones are more fine there because they're used to crazy religions. So Nicolau got, um, initially got his colander on the basis, the, and he had to apply to the Austrian police because that's the way he did in Austria. And the police said, well, we're not judging whether pastafarianism is a religion or not. All you have to do is have your face free so that we can see your face. So that was actually quite a nice way of getting out of the problem. In fact, you might wonder why other authorities don't do this and get around the problem, but no other authorities want to sort of engage with the question of what is a religion and what isn't. And, and you, might, you might even think you know, that that is actually the best solution to the pastafarian issue, pastafarian issue because that really treats everyone fairly. Then you know, anyone could wear whatever they wanted in their driving license photo. Religious or not, there would not be a distinction between religion and non-religion. They could wear a baseball cap, whatever, as long as the pace is clear. Okay, um, so Mick Noam's view is, you know, it's this political idea of what he wants from pastafarianism. He wants a level playing field, total neutrality of the state towards all religious beliefs. Now this is the sort of quite, the sort of hard line, the strict secularist view, and such, such as you get in France. Anyway, um, the law must apply equally to all of us. Um, you know, so believers and non-believers alike, and that's what he's saying. It's not being applied fairly because people who believe in some things but not others are getting special privileges. So this is Amika then had another go because his driving license expired, and he decided he wanted this time to wear pasta crowns both for his um, personal identity card. Yeah, with driving license as well, and it's impossible to do. So he modeled two different pasta for different photos. Um, um, and yeah, he, he took his case all the way up to Europe, all the way to the right, and the appearance of the flights were getting lost, which just proves it exists, obviously. Because um, the Austrians said, no, no, you can't have a pasta crown, sorry. So he took his case to the Human Rights Court, and he said, my Article 9 rights are being discriminated against. Unfortunately, he lost, um, and so did the Austrian Church of the Blind Spaghetti Monster, which wanted to be registered um, as, a, as a, effectively a religious organisation. They wanted to have the same privileges as religion, which might you know, include tax benefits, whatever. Um, in England, by the way, we'll come on to that because there are also similar issues in England. Um, and the almost supreme macaroni of the Austrian Church of the Blind Spaghetti Monster and protested that we're an, a young and innovative religion. We're a world religion, but we have no chance of being recognised. We've met the same criteria as you. You know, we've got this belief. Why are you just rejecting this? It's discrimination. But the ECHR it seems to have been quite conservative in this respect. Australia, um, they didn't try to um, get. I think in some parts of Australia, your driving license photo is okay, but they're again trying to re register as an organisation to get the same privileges as religion. Um, and basically, um, the, the, the judge in the case decided that a pastafarianism is a parody. So it's not serious. Um, you know, the pastafarian text can only be read as a parody or satire. Now, it's quite difficult to disagree with this, um, having regard to things like the eight really, uh, uh, really rugby dillons. Um, it's, it's hard to disagree that it's not just parody, but on the other hand, is, is that enough? Um, she says, you know, religious texts um, carry some perceived truth um, and, a, and an articulation of ca canons of conduct. And she said that um, pastafarianism doesn't do that. Although, actually, if you read um, the Gospel of Flight to the Ghetto Monster, there are actual ethical sort of principles there, which basically, summed up in a nutshell, are be nice to people. Um, which, which you might also say is, is the motto of humanists in a way. Um, but yeah, that, that doesn't count. That's not enough because it's too common. Um, in the US, um, we have a New Yorker councillor who was allowed to wear this colander for his own um, signing of the swearing in. Um, in Canada, on the other hand, which is you might think rather a secular country, in Quebec of all places, which has sort of French strict secularism, um, uh, was most unimpressed with um, a woman's attempt to get her driving license and photo with a pirate here. Um, the, the judge at the Flying Spaghetti Monster was a social movement 
that it allows its adherents to question, albeit in a particularly crazy manner, certain elements of the which constitute the foundations of religion. In other words, pacifianism is critical of religion, it is questioning religion, something which is questioning religion cannot itself be a religion. But this is the problem of pacifianism. And, and in some respects, actually, the problem of free thought and free thinkers. Um, I might come back to that at the end. Okay, the England, um, English law, we of course have slight budget, and quite, and I think it might be, it would be very interesting if anyone had the time and inclination to take this to the courts, actually, because I wonder what, what would be said. Um, on the one hand, um, the DVLA has in one case said no to colanders. Um, in 2015, we have um, an individual just quote, as an eccentric man who decided to well, apply to have a colander in his head. Um, the DVLA was all rather high and mighty about this and said, um, the integrity of the license and the DVLA's reputation among other EU member states um, is important. Um, the publicity that um, this, this whole thing has attracted in other cases undermines the integrity of the DVLA's statutory purpose. So the DVLA's approach is, is just too funny, it's just parody, it's taking this, which of course it is. Um, so that, 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 that's their perspective, which I think actually gets to the heart of, of what this, this whole um, thing is about, this whole pastor parent challenge is about. It is laughing at religion, and it is laughing at sort of authority stipulations of things like driving license photos. It's laughing at the rules, and authorities don't like being laughed at. And so this is what um, Ian Harris said. Um, I have a spiritual connection with the flying spaghetti monster. Until they have brain probes, how are they going to say I don't? This is an interesting question. He says, well, how do you determine whether someone's belief is genuine? If, if I say that I have a spiritual connection with the flying spaghetti monster, how do you prove that I don't? So again, it's a valid question, you know, what is religion? Um, why, why should some people get privileged status over others? Um, people claim that they're religious, but they, maybe they are, maybe they aren't. Um, is, is it about you know, the, the genuineness of their belief? Who's to judge? How can the courts turn to questions like this? <clears throat> but pirate hats are okay at the moment, apparently, in the UK, in England, anyway. Um, this is one um, Colin of Exmouth who uh, sent in this picture to Bobby Henderson's website. Um, First of all, the DVLA sent his application back saying he was wearing a hat, but then he said um, he wanted them to respect his religious beliefs or headwear. And so it says, of course, you can, of course, you can. we're going to respect your religious beliefs. Um, perhaps it didn't know um, that it was, it was past heroism, otherwise it might have had a different view. But the point is, we have two inconsistent rulings, apparently, of the DVLA in England, so it's wide open. Um, I know that uh, Collins' driving license um, it's due to expire on the 19th of March this year, so we'll see what happens there. <laughs> so, is pastafarianism a religion or a parody? Well, uh, in human rights law, as developed by the European Court of Human Rights, the test is a certain level of cogency, seriousness, cohesion, and importance. Now, all of these four criteria have their own special test, um, but the thing which has so far sunk pastafarians is the seriousness because the ECHR's help again and again is not serious. It's a parody, therefore it can't be serious, therefore it can't receive protection. Um, and um, in its sort of leading judgment of this, um, at the moment, um, you know, it, it characterizes the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster as having inspired a movement critical of the influence of a privileged position of women to establish religion. Um, and it seeks to express this criticism by parodying aspects of those religions. Further, it seeks the same privileges for itself. So, um, it, what, what the ECHR doesn't like is that something which is criticizing and parodying religions should then try to have the same privileges as religions. Now, what pastafarians, I think, would say in response to this is they don't want privileges. They don't at all. They want everyone to be treated the same, and they don't see why religion should have privileges. And they're using humour as a way of sort of challenging this whole foundation, this whole inherent structure. In many European countries, many um, legal systems, the religions have these privileges which sort of go with the same. So um, I, I sort of, through one of the articles that, that I published about this in the Free Thinker, I got in touch with um, Frank Cranman, who is a, a 
quake there. I'm an illegal scholar, but very, very liberal minded, I think. Um, and he, he didn't propose to decide whether or not pastoralism is religion, but he did say, you know, after these, these legal um, cases that have been in the UK, domestic authorities um, in the UK should be very careful how they apply this test of the um, emergency seriousness, etc. Um, because one person's cogent and serious belief may be another person's fairy tale. And I think this is again very important. How is it that you propose to say which religions are cogent and serious enough and which aren't? Because the courts always report, even the ECHR, not to go into whether a belief is true or not. They can't. Because they can't say on one hand that Islam is true and Christianity is true and Buddhism is true and Hinduism is true. Some, somewhere along the line, there must be. No, if one of them is true, that may, must mean the other one is not true. So the courts cannot decide which one is true or not. But they can make this sort of, how are they therefore going to make this cogent and serious decision um, and judgment when they, when they can't make a decision about truth? It seems very difficult. Um, so clearly, the flight of the petty monster was originally a clearly. Um, for example, take this explanation. Religious texts tell us that humans evolved from pirates. Consider that so-called science experts would have us believe humans evolved from primates, pointing towards the shared 99% DNA between humans and primates. But humans and pirates are upwards of 99.9% of DNA. So I mean, that's great. <laughs> and you know, these are the sort of posters we have, the artwork by Pastafarians, which are, again, you know, we get the website. Okay, that's not, not true. This is the sort of It was just a rock, a sort of pure art joke about what it is. Two holy walls of and omnipotent and mutant images. That's their original thing. I might say, again, our other religions should be better. So where do you draw the line between parody and religion? Um, now, this idea um, in Article 9 of ECHR, part of it says, as I've pointed out before, that one of the aspects of the right to freedom of religion is the right to change religion. Um, in the case of 1993, called Bakinaka, it's a great case. Um, it was held by the court um, that, that this freedom to change belief is actually an asset for safeguarding the rights of atheists and uh, the unconcerned and people who are not interested in However, as pointed out um, by Paul Clitter, who's a professor um, in, in the Netherlands, I think of the jurisprudence, um, he argues that the court has actually rode back from the Copenhagen's case because it now says that, um, you know, pastafarians are not being, their rights are not being safeguarded by this freedom to change um, clause in part of the article, right? So he says, well, maybe the CHR's own jurisprudence is not consistent with this matter. Um, and, and he and, and Neil Kittigold, another Dutch pastafarian, also argued, you know, why should religion be gloomy? Why exclude humour and joy from the concept of religion? Why is parody incompatible? So they're taking it one stage further. They're saying, well, why can't you have a funny religion? Um, according to the ECHR, you've got to have religion has to be serious. But does it? Some, some have just, well, Dirk Fenema has described Mormonism as absolutely hilarious. This is a um, 19th century depiction of Jesus visiting some ancient American tribe, supposedly. Um, <coughs> and we might think of uh, the, the musical that's currently on the Book of Mormon, which um, one of the creators has described as an atheist love letter to religion. Um, I haven't seen it myself. Has anyone here seen it? Yeah, yeah so some it's people have. Yeah. <laughs> how, how would you say it sort of depicts Mormonism? Very funny. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe tongue in cheek. Yes, absolutely. Great, exactly. So, I mean, things like this, right? There are definitely crazy aspects to some religions. So, why are they accepted as being privileged and protected when pastafarianism isn't? So, should we just should we just make up loads more religions and privilege them all and just only let people who are not religious just have no privileges? Or should we just say that somehow we've got to get back to a sort of initial position where everyone is treated properly, the same in law, without compromising many people's freedom to be religious if they want, but with, with limits? And then the question is always, where are those limits? So um, if we think, for example, of a cartoonist um, called Larry um, 
that plant helps in America. Um, he, he was told in a dream that he needed to do cartoons of Jesus sort of helping people. Um, so the idea is that sort of Jesus is sort of over your shoulder all the time, which you might think of is a bit creepy, but anyway, so um, this is a sort of plastic <laughs> error. And, and, you know, again, plastic arenas and functions to sort of show up, you know, some of the absurdities of religion through humour. Humour is such a strong weapon for challenging excessive authority and moral orthodoxy, and always has been, which is one of the great things about pastafarianism, I think. But it, in the sort of late 2010s, early 2020s, we've had a different movement. Um, we've had the culture wars, we've had Brexit, Trump, COVID. We've had, we've had especially in sort of the Anglosphere, we've had a move towards a lot more seriousness, a lot more gloom, a lot less humour, you might say. Um, and what's interesting is that some pastafarians, not all, have sort of slightly altered their impath. Um, in, in 2016, you might see pastafarians with, with um, colanders at protests um, by, say, fundamentalist Islamists or something like that, and just, just standing there with the colander on the head to make a point. Now it's gone at full circle in a way. Um, now, Bobby Henderson has, has, again, I think he's slightly moderated his own views um, on his website. That's just my impression. I don't, I don't know. I haven't asked him. But he, he makes clear all sorts of things about how he has no problem with religion now on his website. I personally don't have an issue with people wearing religious symbols or headwear at work. Now, I think that is not what NATO arm or something like that would think. So there are definitely different denominations. There may be slightly to be a, a schism in pastoralism somewhere along the line. But in Quebec, which previously, you know, we had a legal judgment saying that people can't wear um, parakeet in their ID photos, but now um, we have a we have a bill which became an act um, in 2019, which which sort of enforced again this strict French style of secularism, um, and it's been criticised by no less than a pastafarian teacher in Quebec, um, again on on Bobby Henderson's website, um, who says you know, the bill prohibits people from wearing religious symbols in the workplace. This may seem to be a secular move, but it disproportionately affects religious minorities um, and women. So therefore, he decided he was going to wear his colander in the classroom to support religious people having their right to wear hekia in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So that poses a whole new challenge about you know, what is the use of post pastor parents and where does it go? And then he was sort of suspended from school for doing this. Um, should, should pastor Baronism, should wearing a colander be used to challenge religious privilege? Should it be used to support religious privilege if religious people are considered as being sort of oppressed. Cuts in many different ways. Um, now Paul Kutter, um, with the Dutch professor, has um, said, you know, in some ways pastafarianism is the ideal religion. If all humanity were pastafarians, people with a sense of humour and a relaxed attitude towards their religious conviction, that would be a tremendous improvement. So he's saying, well, you know, maybe maybe pastafarianism can be a sort of religion, but, but a good religion. Um, in a way. Um, he, he isn't necessarily a pastafarian himself, but he's just making the case for saying, well, why can't pastafarians be a religion? Um, and Mika de Wilde, who was involved in one of the Dutch um, ID photo cases, um, she argues, she, she insists on wearing her colander on her head at all times when I dress, um, to make the point. She said, well, look, I wear my colander all the time. Why can't I have it in my ID photo? I wear it just as much as anyone else wears any other piece of religious headgear. And she said, well, you know, Pastafarianism is just as real as other religions. Well, I may not believe literally in the flying spaghetti monster. I may believe metaphorically that it's nice to be nice to people. How is that different from many religious people who don't literally believe in, you know, what the Bible is the word of God, but still get privileges? Where is the difference? And that is the continual question posed by Pastafarians. Where is the difference? And then finally, I'm from Captain Kenya Watkins. Um, Pastafarianism has all of the same elements that any religion has, and it, it does now because it's really developed so much since Bobby Henderson's letter. Out of nothing, it's developed into this whole thing. Well, maybe like Christianity, who knows? Um, to be a Pastafarian, you just need to be a lot, which is, I think, a great, very tolerant. You see, what's wrong with a religion that's so tolerant? Um, so that's Pastafarianism. Um, so it really, I think, poses this challenge, and I think. Um, Courts in, in Europe, courts in the US and in Canada haven't really got their heads around do we need to have a rethink about what religion is and how it should be treated even more and why should we have this religious exceptionalism. 
And just very quickly at the end, I'm, since I'm here, and, and I'm the editor of the Free Thought, I just thought I'd introduce it to you. Um, so first of all, what is free thought? Well, we have humanism, we have secularism, we have atheism. Um, free thought is sort of an idea that goes back in the same strain a long way. Um, first use of it was probably about 1697 in English. And then you have the um, Libre Pensée, also in French with the people of Voltaire in the 18th century. It's quite an enlightenment concept in a way. Um, the free exercise of reason and matters of religious belief, rationalism. So again, it's all linked up to, to humanism. A free thinker is a person who refuses to submit the reasoning process to the control of authority and religious belief. And I think that's important because I think the way free thought relates to humanism and secularism is that secularism you might think of as a political stance. Humanism is a whole full life philosophy. And free thought is, is if you like, an attitude. It's the idea that you have to work things out for yourself. It's very much a sort of independent-minded view. Um, you don't accept something on authority without asking why. So it's about questioning. And the other side of the coin to free thought is free speech, because unless you have the liberty to speak freely, you don't have the liberty to think freely. Um, and so these are some of the issues which the free thinker, um, since I've taken over, um, deals with. Um, so this website has been around since I started in January last year. Um, our, our sort of stance is culturally liberal, um, politically unaligned, whatever that means. We try to sort of have a range of views from across the political spectrum and apolitical, but always cons considering these issues of religion, secularism, belief, humanism, but also, you know, how, how we should be able to speak freely in different circumstances and where do you draw the line um, at the edge of free speech, or what, what are the proper limits for free speech in a civilised society. Um, so this is just the latest um, page, and you can find it at freethinker.co.uk. If you're interested, um, if you go to newsletter, you can sign up for our sort of fortnightly or three weekly newsletter, which just gives you a sort of summary. Um, and do follow us also, if you're interested, on Twitter at freethinkermag. We also have a little um, Facebook group, freethinkermag, where we have a lot of um, quite heated discussions about topics. Um, so that's all from me, um, and I think we'll have a, a little break now for people to have another drink, and then we'll have some questions afterwards. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, anyone have any questions that would like to start? Um, I was yeah. just joking, so my only second time here. I used to be evangelical for five or seven years, my mum was right, just a phase. It was seen <laughs> to me that the Presbyterian movement, are they very good at proselytizing? Do they attempt to evangelize? Do they exhibit at freshers' fairs and street stuff? I mean, do they take the parody that far, or are they fairly, not elite, selective, non proselytizing? Seems if they believe that's the terrorism is the true faith, then they must be obliged to, to win the struggles. Mm. Well, I mean, thank you for that question. First of all, to all religions, sometimes I'm not sure. The only religion is evangelicalism, of course. Okay, yeah. okay I've got a narrow base. <laughs> I'll be quiet for a minute. But I mean, on that point, I can't answer for all um, Pasteurian churches around the world, but I mean, as far as I'm aware, say the ones in Europe don't. Um, they're just very or in Australia, I don't know the ones I've talked about, they're very informal. They just meet for a beer because beer is very important <laughs> at the place of news. And you know, just they, it's just a sort of community of like minded people in many ways. Thank you. Yeah. Um, this has grown up uh, in reaction to uh, creationist Christian uh, belief in America. Is there any sign of any similar? movement within the Muslim religion, the sort of anti-religious parody um, <coughs> movement there? Thank you. Well, that's a very good question. Not as far as I'm aware. Um, but that is that is a very interesting question. Um, now, of course, although Pastor was originally within and against evangelical Christianity, um, its point about headgear, I think, very much is sort of criticising religions which were headgear, in other words, mainly Muslims and also to some extent Sikhs and Jews. Perhaps um, in their missionary activities they could persuade one or two Muslims to, or ex-Muslims rather, yeah. to um, move the same way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's an interesting question, thank you. Um, so thinking from the point of view of the official security in kind of like, yeah. uh, I'm just thinking psychologically-wise, if 
we think of, uh, this is outside the norm. Therefore, I'm just going to reject it. Just so that I'm not my dog not back or anything like that. You know, it's kind of like and then it's outside the status quo. Right. For for who, sir? From the person, the bureaucracy point of view. Yeah. Yeah, they it's like they see it's Yeah. I think they always have this and they say, look, this is not a traditional religion, so they're going to reject it. Yeah, thank you very much. I think that's a very good point, is that it's not traditional, it's not accepted, it's not established. And I mean, I think we see that um, if you look, say, at charity school, um, it's quite interesting to see what um, organisations, what groups the Charity Commission has considered to be religious mm -hmm. and what it hasn't. Um, I think Scientology is not, for example, um, although maybe I think for the purposes of re registering, or registering a religious building it is, um, I think Wiccaism um, or Wicca and sort of witchcraft and druidism are not, um, because I don't know if they're too recent, too kooky, but you know, the mainstream ones are longer than that. Sorry, I'll give our last question to that. The, you know, the Wiccaism and all that kind of yeah. stuff. So clearly, there's a tradition there Absolutely. for our history. Mm. So, why, why should that be? That's, that's a, a thank you, there. That's a good point. I mean, maybe it's just not established, maybe it's always been sort of undercover or something. Again, yeah. mm -hmm. it's 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 it shows how other truth. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The thing about the headgear interests me uh, <clears throat> about lots of religions have some sort of visible token that you have to wear, mm -hmm. um, which um, might not have been logically thought out by the originators of those religions, but which have kind of evolved as a successful um, strategy from an evolutionary point of view, in as much as once you are wearing the token, turban, whatever, headgear, or scarf, or whatever, it's difficult to get rid of it without making a public statement about the fact that you are not part of that religion anymore. Mm -hmm. and, so, and it also acts as a, a piece of advertising for the people who run that faith, that um, this is how many members I've got, you know, because you can just see them because of the, the headgear or whatever. Um, but that's where the, you know, the Pratiparians go a bit wrong because it's just they've adopted the same policy as everyone else and they have from the app to advertise. Um, and I think. Sorry, I don't know what point I'm going to make in that. <laughs> <laughs> but, I started out on a good line. <laughs> but, but thank you. I, mean, I think there is a point there, which is, well, well, why is it any best to wear, wear a collar than anything else? I think actually the interesting thing there is that pastafarians, if you ask them, they will say, well, we won't wear a collar if no one else does wear, wear their headgear. So they are not wedded to it in the same way that other religions are. But actually, that has, I believe, in some cases, been used against them. Um, um, because the um, judges have said, well, you know, you don't have to wear it. It's your choice. Whereas these religions, they have to wear it. So that's the difference. Um, but the past parents say, well, we're being more re reasonable than the others, so why should you discriminate against us? It's a bit of an ambush to certain point. I think what Matt was trying to say, to yeah. where, can, where can you get the uh, black Columbus that uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the local Dutch supermarket. <laughs> but you know, any 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 Columbus will do. Take your pick. Yeah. I, I don't know if you know that there's uh, a body of work um, other than the Gospel of Christ for Guessing on the um, Those who've been touched by his nuclear appendage, um, pesto beer probably. Um, <laughs> It's a real term, by the way. Um, <laughs> um, there's a, 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 sort of a booklet on PDF called the, the Loose Cannon. Yes, yeah, And if you've read that, I, I contributed to that. <laughs> um, there was going to be a second one as well, um, but somebody uh, used some of the, the stories that we've written and tried to start to sell them in Amazon. So, but if you go onto the, the actual forum, the old forum, you'll find all those um, uh, stories there, those sort of gospels. So, yeah. um, it's the first one was the loose cannon, originally was um, obviously very Christian, mm -hmm. Jewish, 
um, the orientation because that's where it came from. But um, we were trying to get the, the second of Canon to be um, more sort of universal, focusing more on Eastern religions rather than sort of what we used to with Christianity, the Judeo Christian uh, concept. So, yeah, you do know that it's Canon. Yeah, thank you. But I think this again raises an interesting point. We, the way we've seen Pastafarianism evolve with all these new texts and everything. There are really interesting parallels from an anthropological perspective with the rise of Christianity or maybe the rise of Islam. You know, you start off with one idea, one person, and then it just balloons all by itself into all these different texts and this whole culture um, in its own way. And you know, some of them live, some of them die. So it's again, you know, it's just the idea of the me. Um, and we'll see. We, I think we have yet to see how strong a me as a is. So, kind of that, um, sorry, kind of a, 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 a mirror of how to the in the Old Testament, Christian Old Testament, <coughs> was made <coughs> sort of with the past arms and all that sort of stuff that are in it. Um, yeah, it does sort of mirror that in a way, which is pretty devised. It's, it's, um, it's sort of, um, made that way from the beginning, but it does give you quite a nice insight to how religion can make these stars. Definitely, you know, you start with um, the pirate year and then you move to the colonies and you have these schisms, different views. And in another context, if there had been religions, they might have started fighting against them. Pastafarianism, so Pastafarianism, peace loving, so I do that. Yeah. So, um, um, so in this room, um, being a successful uh, being criticizing their own institutions and trying to make sense out of uh, what the human rights are. Uh, is that like in how they fund their activity? Like do they get like a pasta company <laughs> donating them? <laughs> 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 I don't know how can you get and you need, you need to have somebody to have a you know branding or to make it you know going. Thank you, Yuki. I think that's really interesting. But actually, as far as I can tell, for most of the Pastafarian organisations, they're not really organisations at all, not least because they have no legal status in the, I mean, those countries. So most of the time, they just seem to be just a casual group of friends who call themselves Pastafarians. They have a WhatsApp group, um, and then they just meet sometimes and have a bit, and that's about it. Um, so they don't really have branding. The exception to that is um, Bobby Henderson himself on his website. Um, I don't know the ins and outs of that. He does seem to charge um, the, for some things, perhaps Dean can speak a bit more about that. I know he sells merch. Yeah. Uh, merchandise on there and sends donations to run the website as well. But then I think he's had a fair amount of money from the uh, Gospel of the Flying to get him into it. Um, that I imagine that uh, part of that went to be running the uh, Ben Gaines. Yeah, Ben Gaines website. Yeah. Thank you. Isn't it a matter of thinking? Uh, it's a term, I think, that religions get as, as funded on the state. It does, they do. Is it grants? Well, I mean, the law, if you were an established one, you recognize religion and get funded. But I mean, still, one of course, that raises a question about how do you convince the government to do that? Because it is, it is ultimately often a question of money. It is about this, this yeah. status thing. Yeah. And that's again, that's going to be my follow-up on the status. Yeah. Is, um, it comes down to like tax breaks. It does. You don't get tax breaks yeah. or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Any reason for the tax breaks? They wouldn't change. Yeah. But I mean, again, I. Sorry, we're just debating amongst ourselves about Germany, the Lutherans, and we think the Catholics. All right. Again, yeah. state funding. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this section, if you are an organised like it's a religious uh, institution, then you get the uh, a tax benefit. So I would recommend Japanese company. They said they have a ramen then, instead of ramadan, so they have to eat ramen. <laughs> and, but I've actually, it's interesting what's happened in, in, in England with this in English law. I'm not sure exactly how this is Scotland. But um, so humanism, secularism, atheism, freedom never used to be charitable purposes in the way that you know 
in the past, the advancement of religion was not just a charitable purpose, but it had this special status that it was presumed that a religion would be a benefit, a positive mm. religion would be a benefit. And therefore, you did, if you wanted to be a religious organization that got charitable status, you didn't even have to prove that you were doing that you were benefiting anyone. Um, that presumption was um, abolished in 2006, but um, at the same time, um, in law in England, it's still in the Charities Act 2011 now, it still says the advancement of religion is a charitable purpose. It does not say the advancement of religion or belief is a charitable purpose, which is quite interesting. So the advancement of a non-religious belief technically is not a charitable purpose. Now, Humanist UK, very clever, and they got an exception to this, or they, they somehow persuaded the Charity Commission to allow the advancement of humanism to be a charitable purpose. So if you are an organi um, a humanist organisation in the UK and you are not already registered as a charity for the advancement of humanism, you should, because you can. Um, whereas um, our five four organisation, the Free Thinker, which is um, funded by um, an old Victorian organisation called Secular Society Limited, we can't be a charity because the, the advancement of free thought is not a charitable purpose. So again, you see, it, it's all about definition. Why are some things accepted? Why aren't others? It's, it's all about this, this drawing of the lines, and I think basically law is in a mess at the moment. And we've suddenly had this huge rush of secularism and um, secularization of society, and also this emergence of other religions and, and non religions. And I think the law in the UK and in other countries just hasn't caught up yet. We don't know what to do with this new situation we find ourselves in, basically. Did you do some official conversion for I do have a few PhDs, that's a foreign PhD. There was a time when I was giving out PhDs on the website, documents I've made up for spurious theses. I was funding that for about a year. Definitely does. I mean, you can say from that perspective, you know, seriousness. And you might say the same of any single world religion. Can, you cannot be serious, you might say, about any one of them, right? But this is from, what's interesting, this is from our perspective in the 21st century as people who have, you know, we've got science now. Science has completely exploded from, you know, from many people's perspectives, most of religion. But the law, culture, the establishment just has not caught up at all. And I think that is really the part of the point of pastoralism. It just, you know, serious is very much an old fashioned concept, if you like, or seems to be in, in, in your opinion. They just act, they, they can't yet understand, they can't like see it as not serious because it's always been serious, it's always tradition. James? Yeah, I guess kind of following on from Martin. Yeah. I think most of the major religions, and even some of the more recent ones, have a, a part of their origin myth is <clears throat> about the struggle to be accepted initially. Yeah. So is there a case to say that the yeah. church that's trying to begin some answer is, is only going through what all what we now class as reasonable religions went through in, in many cases probably with less oppression than other main, more mainstream religions actually went through? Yeah, 
Yes, they might be. So they might be in a stage of not yet being accepted, but maybe one day they will be. Um, which I think would be a bit of a shame in a way, and I think many pastafarians would think so too. They don't necessarily want to be accepted as a religion. They just don't want religion to be treated specially because some people have a belief in strange supernatural things, which other people don't. Um, you, if you ask, say, Captain Tanya Watkins um, from Australia, but when I spoke to her about this, I, I don't know whether her views have changed since then, but she said, you know, I don't actually want to have special tax breaks for the church of the people's bodies we're getting on through in Australia. I just don't want religions to have tax breaks. So, you know, again, it's the question of equality of treatment, but just not privileging religions qua religions. So, you know, if, if pastafarianism is just absorbed into the sort of religious framework, I think that will sort of miss the point in a way. Because it's trying to, it's, it's iconoclastic, it's trying to break down the system. At least some of them, yeah. How many Pastafarians are there nationally or internationally? Do you have any idea? The, the Pastafarian numbers, I, I don't know. Um, it's a bit murky because there, a lot of them are just sort of online, um, through online forum and stuff like that. Um, but Bobby Henderson claims it's the world's fastest growing religion. I don't know again, um, but if you think that. Um, yeah, but if it doubles, yeah. I would like for That may be going. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the rate of growth may not reflect yeah, the market. going 200 to 500 in three days, but yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm afraid I just don't know. It's, it's, no. it's, 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 it would be an interesting question. Not very many, but on the other hand, the pastor friends would say, you know, anyone can be a pastor friend. Anyone is a pastor friend. You know? well, it's a political issue. I mean, it, yeah. it's sort of. Um, non religious people arguably now make up the majority in this country. Church of England is now minority, and Catholics certainly are, and those things and so on. It, it requires political initiative to disestablish the Church of England, to abolish the yeah. bishops in the house of Lords, church, church schools, and all the rest of it. Um, it's probably not until we no longer sort of be ruled by a governing party that is wed it seems to be wedded to the Church of England that things will change. Mm -hmm. But it will have to be a political initiative ultimately that can fundamentally change things. Yes, no, I, I absolutely agree with you. There has to be the political will. Yeah. And I'm judging from what I've done, the work I did for the National Secular Society, and just you know, talking to people in, involved in these various secularist campaigns, there does not yet seem to be the political will. I mean, not least because we've been through so many upheavals um, in so many other respects. Um, will we see um, the Church of England disestablished in any of our lifetimes? I don't know. Um, will we see an end to the monarchy? Who knows what will happen when, when Prince Charles eventually does? I'm looking to us. Um, but I, I think that, you know, pastafarians are, are normally also atheists. They're normally also secularists. They're, they're all part of the same group in a way. It's just that they use humour. Um, and that their point is to criticise um, Why should beliefs be privileged over criticising beliefs? Why should a belief attitude be privileged over a critical non-belief attitude? Um, and I think you might say that if it's the majority are non-religious, then the majority have a sort of non-critical attitude. They don't just have sort of strict beliefs. Um, so they're there, but it, it's almost as though the fact of being non-religious means you don't care as much about things like um, bishops as, as if you are religious. So perhaps that's why it's harder to change. Non-religious people are just maybe not interested in some of these issues. I don't like the expression all religions and none. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's strange. It's a strange sort of all faiths and none. The none is very negative. Yes. Um, which I think is one, one good thing that, that humanism does is to say, you know, human, humanism need not be negative, it can have some positive content to it. But I mean, I mean, not it can also just be critical, questioning, open, sort of Socratic. <clears throat> I just want to, in your research, uh, did you come across any other Caribbean religions that are on the rise or not? I don't know if they're on the rise. Um, the Temple of Satan is one. They, they sort of, I think they're mainly in America based. They sort of go around getting um, statues of Satan put up um, in various public places. Um, and then there's Jediism, of course. Um, they're, they're struggling to be recognised. There, there are some Jedis. But they have the numbers, don't they? Yeah, they, they do have some numbers. I don't know what, what they're, they're up to, but they're definitely there. Um, yeah. Um, I, I think there are actually quite a lot. If you do a, a, a Wikipedia search, there are sort of about um, a dozen or so listed. Um, they're, they're quite obscure, even more obscure than the best of and they don't necessarily have the sense of humour that the best 